All right. And it's time I'm going to ask uh, Brother Kennedy, if you don't mind, give us an opening prayer, my brother. Get us started. Let us pray. Our Father God in heaven, we're just so grateful and thankful for this day, uh, this hour, uh, where we're gathered from the comfort of our homes, um, putting ourselves in position to another study, another portion of your word, Father. A day that is uh, that we don't have to be here, Father, but we are. And we are because we love you. And we love you because you loved us first. And we're just so grateful for your men servants who allow these studies to happen um, outside of um, our personal studies and outside of worship that just gives us another opportunity to just uh, get to know you and um, get closer and closer to you, Father. Um, we're just so grateful for uh, the previous study that we have, and then we're uh, grateful and always ready to learn about kingdom families, kingdom marriages, and anything that has to deal with the kingdom and how we as individuals must play a crucial part in that but it starts with us being obedient with your word, Father, and we're just so grateful for that. Um, we're just so thankful for all the avenues that we have um, and the freedoms that we have being in this country where um, we're not uh, necessarily worried about being persecuted um, to get to know you, Father, but we know that we do have many brethren abroad that do suffer persecution for wanting to put on Christ, and we just pray for them and pray that um, if it if it be a way that Father that they will be able to find some avenue and some some way to continue to serve you and be faithful for the end, for we know that there's a greater reward for them as long as they continue to be obedient to your word. Uh, Father, we're just so grateful for this hour, and we're just so thankful for Jesus and His sacrifice and His ability to just continuing to wanting to go to the cross on our behalf, putting. Uh, sin on the back burner so that way we may have a path father because without him there was only one path for us and that was destruction and he gave us a path a path that was more clear uh, and, and and gave us a, a path to everlasting life and that is something that I, I believe everyone in this call wants father and we just pray that those who participate um, have a sincere heart uh, that they don't uh, join these sessions um, and not apply the things that are being said um, to their lives, Father, and 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 then also um, willing to share it with somebody else, Father, because there's always a soul that is needing to be saved. Um, we're just so thankful and grateful for the support systems of their family uh, that allows them, and Father, we just continue to be with their families, continue to be with Brother Ozan and his recovery process, continue to be with Sister Stevenson and uh, his wife and, and uh, whatever it is that she is needed, Father, to um, to have the portion of health that is needed to 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 be full strength, Father, so he can continue to um, push forward, Father, be with um, Brother Bowers and, and the Bowers family as uh, he, he's lost a brother um, and was still able to get on the call and then uh, give a heartfelt prayer uh, when many did not know the things that he was going through father and uh, be with brother coffee and the ministry that he has and the new location that that's taking place be with brother green and his wife and uh, the medical condition father we just pray that uh, for all your saints father especially those who are of the household and are steadfast and, and loyal father we just pray that whatever is needed to if it be your will <laughs> to get us back into the fight um and stay in the fight, Father. We just pray that you would allow that. Um, and um, Father, we just love you. And we're just so grateful to be in your presence. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Kennedy. We're going to start in Matthew chapter 7. And I want to start at verse number 24. We're going to deal with the subject, uh, brothers and sisters, removing worry from kingdom family homes. Again, the subject matter is removing worry from kingdom family homes. In Matthew 7, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, verse 24, Therefore, whosoever hear these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. 
The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes, removing worry from kingdom family homes. You know, brothers, in order for any home uh, uh, to survive storms, uh, storms of life, it, it means that, you know, you're going to have to have a, a good foundation. I think we understand this when it comes to our, our physical homes. And you have a home and you notice there's cracks in the wall. Uh, sometimes, you know, you have cracks that can happen, that can transpire. Uh, usually, you know, what it can a sign of is a it's a sign of you may have some fine uh, some foundation problems and now there are some things that you and I can do when you see cracks in a wall you can either choose to to paint over it you can choose to ignore it uh, you can uh, sell the problem to somebody else or I hope what you decide to do if you're able to is to fix it. And I think the same is true when it comes to our spiritual families. I think we ought to have an attitude uh, to fix the foundation that may be destroying our kingdom family at home. And one of the areas that's destroying kingdom family at home is the area, brothers and sisters, of, of worry. Uh, there are families that are destroyed because you have one, two, or all of the family uh, that is worried, overly worried, about the things that transpire in their life. And what I want you to understand is that worry and fear and faith cannot go hand in hand. I'm going to say that again. Worry and, and, and fear and faith cannot walk together. And so we as kingdom families, we understand we got to walk by faith, brothers and sisters, and, and not by sight. And without faith, we cannot please God. Hebrews 11 and 6, the Hebrew writer says it like this. In Hebrews 11 and verse number 6, he says, and, but without faith, listen to this, it's impossible. Please get that. It is, brothers and sisters, impossible to please him. For he that come to him, uh, come to God, must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. In other words, when we walk by faith, faith comes by hearing, hearing comes by the word of God. We must not only read God's word, we must trust God's word, we must believe God's word. And that has shown, brothers and sisters, in how you and I conduct ourselves in this life. Again, we walk by faith and not by sight. In our text in Matthew chapter 7, where we started, I want you to notice in these verses that Jesus gives in his Sermon on the Mount that it doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not a Christian, the storms of life come. It doesn't matter whether you're building your house on sand or whether you're building your house on the rock. The, the same thing happened to both foundations. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat up on that house. The only difference was the foundation. And so I hope we understand that we live in a world of sin. And I don't care if you're a Christian family or not a Christian family, we understand that the storms of life will come to each and every home, okay? That's just kind of world that we live in, brothers and sisters. Once Adam and Eve sinned, got put out of the garden, we now live in a world that is saturated uh, with issues, with problems. But the thing about it, if we make Christ the solid rock of our foundation, brothers and sisters, we can make it. And, and we can we can overcome and because we are overcomers. Now, one of the things that Jesus wants us to be, and I want you to go to Matthew chapter five, because he mentions this in Matthew chapter five. He wants you and I as as those who are the, of us or who is his disciples. He wants you and I, brothers and sisters, to live blessed lives. I want to make sure we get that. He wants us to be blessed. Jesus does. In essence, he wants us to be happy. And I believe and I know that we can be happy, brothers and sisters, in Christ Jesus, regardless of the issues, the trials and the tribulations that we will will face in this world. When you look at Matthew chapter 5, I want you to notice here, look with me in verse number 3 through 6. In Matthew 5, 3 through 6, Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Look at verse 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, he says, for they shall be filled. Drop down to verse 11. Blessed are you when, when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. He says, rejoice, listen to this, and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And so what is Jesus saying? Well, even when life happens, brothers and sisters, I think what Jesus is telling us is we can still be glad. Even when life hits us, knocks us upside our head, I think what Jesus is telling us 
If you are a disciple, if you're following him, if he's your foundation, then he's teaching you and I that we can, in fact, be, be happy. And I hope all of us get that in our spirit. As a child of God on this side of heaven, we should be living joyful lives. We can be joyful in our family. We can be joyful in our lives. Now, that being said, go to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, in order for that to happen, brothers and sisters, Jesus says on three occasions in Matthew chapter 6, what he does not want us to do, and that is to worry. I'm going to say that again. Three times in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus tells us what he does not want you and I to do. And what he doesn't want you and I to do is he does not want you and I to worry. Look in Matthew 6 and look with me in verse number 25. In Matthew 6, 25, Jesus says these words. He says, therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor yet for what, uh, your body, what you shall put on, is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment. Drop down to verse, uh, verse number 31. He said, therefore, take no thought. When I say, when he says, therefore, take no thought, he saw him out, don't worry, brothers and sisters. That is, that is what that means. Do not worry. Take no thought saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what whither shall we be clothed? Drop down one more time in verse 34. Take, take therefore no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself sufficient unto the day, he says, is the evil thereof. Three times, don't worry. You see that? Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Now, when he uses that word, don't worry, he simply, it doesn't mean you don't have to be concerned about it things. We understand that. We, he's not saying don't make plans. That's not what he's saying either. Uh, what he is teaching is you and I should not be anxious. That's the idea. Live with a divided mind. That's the idea behind take no thought. Be anxious. Troubled with care. Anxiety. There are a lot of Christians that come to church on Sunday, Wednesday, study your Bible, but you're still living with anxiety. You're overly concerned because when you have this kind of worry that Jesus is telling us we shouldn't have, it's a person that's living with a divided mind. You say you believe, but you really got some doubt about your belief. You say that you believe God can take care of you, but there's really some doubt maybe he won't take care of me. And this is exactly what Jesus is commanding you and I not to do. We can't be so overcome, brothers and sisters, with worry for what is and what will be that you forget that God is with you. And I think this is exactly what Jesus is teaching you and I. And please get this, Matthew 6, 25, 31, and verse number 34, these are not options. This is a commandment. This is like just like going to all the world and preach the gospel of every creature. He that believes and is baptized should be saved. When Jesus is saying, take no thought, he is commanding those of us who are kingdom children, who are in the kingdom, he is commanding you and I that we cannot, do not worry. And when you start worrying, like he's talking about in this text, understand this, brothers and sisters, you are down a road, you're on a road that will lead you to sin. Now, in Philippians chapter 4, go to Philippians 4. Paul talks about this. I'm going to come back here in just a few moments. We'll go to Philippians chapter 4. This is a thought brothers and sisters, that the Holy Spirit gives over and over and over in the scriptures to those of us who are kingdom uh, family, uh, kingdom children, because we have God's spirit. Over and over, he tells us, don't worry, trust God, because, because faith and fear cannot go hand in hand. Never have, never will. Faith and fear can never go hand in hand. And it's more than just quoting scriptures, brothers and sisters. If we have to be more than scripture quoters. We're going to have to take the stuff we learn, and we're going to have to be able to apply it when we're on the windswept seas of life. When life hits us, we still have to keep the faith. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6, here's that word worry that Paul is using in Philippians 4, 6. He says, be careful, there we go, be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Now, let me tell you what God will do. Look at verse 7. And the peace of God, that's what we want, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds. How will God do that? Through Christ Jesus. That's how God will do it. When you and I understand that Christ is my solid foundation, he's who I stand on, he's my life, then brothers and sisters, he will take care of me. He will take care of you. And so you and I don't have to be worrying ourselves to death. What we have to do is focus on the goodness of God. That's what you have, you and I have to do. We've got to focus on the goodness of God is what we should do. And so it's impossible. It's impossible to fully focus on God when you're worrying. Make sure you get that. It is impossible 
for you and I to fully trust God <laughs> when you are overly worried and concerned about your situation. And this is why he tells us to not do it. Now go back to Matthew 6. And what I want to do tonight, I want to give you five clear steps from Jesus's mouth on how you and I can win over worry. It's one thing to talk about it, isn't it? It's another thing to know how to do it. See, I know we know we all know the right answer. Yeah, I shouldn't worry. But yeah, okay, you know that. But then, then what's the remedy for it? You know, Jesus doesn't tell us, I'm going to say this. He doesn't tell us what to do and don't tell us how to do it. I want to make sure you get that. When we read the Bible, God will always tell us, this is what I want you to do. And he always tells us, and this is how you, I want you to do it. This is how you do it. Even when he tells you what to put on, when Jesus says, I want you to put on this and I want you to take off that, he tells you what to take off and he tells you and I what to put on. The, 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 the thing is, are we going to be willing to walk by faith and do it? Am I going to trust God enough to take off what needs to be taken off and I'm going to put on what needs to be put on? And so if Jesus does the same thing in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6. I'm going to give you these five things and then I'm done. In Matthew 6, 24, this is how you and I went over worry. Look at verse 24. He says, no man, Matthew 6, 24, no man can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Listen to this. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, number one, first thing that you and I need to understand, if we're going to win over worry, you need to announce who your king is. That's what you need to do. When you hit your feet, hit the floor. If the Lord wakes you up, the first thing you need to do is you need to announce who your king is. And when you announce who your king is, who is your rock, who's your foundation, it will help you with all the other decisions and all the other things that's going to happen in your life on that particular day. But you've got to make up your mind that God is my king. I am living for him today. That's what I'm living for. See, a divided mind. You can't have it both ways. One foot in the world, one foot in the church. And then when tough times come, then you're going to make, then you got to. I sit there and wonder, well, what am I going to do? How am I going to handle this particular situation? Go to Daniel chapter 3. Hold your tassel there just real quickly. This just came to my mind. Daniel chapter 3. You know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are in a foreign land. They're in Babylon. They're away from home. And you know, Nebuchadnezzar is a king. That's exactly. Exactly what he is. He's a king over Babylon. And but you have these three individuals in Matt and Daniel chapter three who understand, yeah, he may be the king in Babylon, but I know the king of kings. That's what they know. They know God. And that makes the difference. They have made up their mind. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, even though they're living in a foreign land, uh, they made up their mind. You know, I may not be in Jerusalem, but that doesn't mean I don't know my God. I still know who God is. And so when the tough time came, when the trial came, they were able to stand firm and flat footed in the faith. In Daniel chapter three, look with me, if, and, and you know the story already, that statue, they refused to bow down uh, to that statue. And King Nebuchadnezzar was furious. Uh, about these boys not bowing down to that statue, but he wanted to give them a second chance. In Daniel chapter 3, 15, listen what he says. He says, now, if you be ready that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sagba, the psaltery, the, dulc uh, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if you worship not, Daniel 3, 15, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace, and who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? You see that? Here's their storm. Here is their dilemma. Now, listen, if they're, listen they, that hour, they were going to be thrown in the fire. Now, listen, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we're not careful. In other words, we ain't worried. We're not concerned. We've got our mind made up to answer you in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from this burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, maybe he will, maybe he won't. But you know what? We're still made of our mind. We still know who our God is. But if not, be it known unto you, O king, that we will not serve your gods nor worship the golden image which you have set up. How could they do that? Because they wake up every day and they know who their God is. But so I'm telling you what you and I do is, as Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, you need to announce who your king is. 
Too many of us, our homes aren't what they're supposed to be because we, we have divided interests. We're too divided. We want the world. We want the worldly stuff. We want the world's approval. And at the and if it means you know uh, you know sacrificing or bending to the rules a little bit, you know, as it relates to the kingdom, then we will do it. And I'm not just talking specifically tonight just about even just sin. You know, some of us don't announce our king even when it comes to things that, you know, you and I are supposed to do. There are things, let me say this, there are things, brothers and sisters, that you and I can be doing that are good, but there's always something that could be better done. You know, go to Luke chapter 10. You know this story here. You know, when you look at Luke chapter 10, Martha and Mary... Martha and Mary were both honoring Jesus. This is the point I'm making here. In Luke chapter 10, they're both honoring Jesus. After all, Jesus is in their home. So they're both honoring Jesus. The problem was one was too distracted. One was distracted by something that was far less important than the other. In Luke chapter 10 and verse number 38, now it came to pass as they went, that he, talking about Jesus, entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha, and look at Luke 10, 40. But Martha was cumbered about. Y'all see that word, cumbered about? That means she had a whole lot of baggage. That's what that means. She was dragging around a whole lot of stuff. So she is cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister have left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, here we go. You're careful. Y'all see that word? He keeps on about anxious. You're careful. You're anxious. You're overly concerned. You're worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary had chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Fatal distraction. Brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, fatal distractions is what's causing a lot of saints to worry. When you get up every morning, here you go. You need to announce who your king is. That's the first and foremost thing you need to, and I need to do. Now go back to Matthew chapter six. Secondly, you need to trust God's love and power. Go back to Matthew chapter six. Second thing you need to do is trust God's love and trust his power. It's one thing to say, I know who my king is. It's another thing isn't it, to trust that he loves you and to trust that he has power to provide for you. In Matthew chapter 6, again, look with me in verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought of your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on, is not the life more than me, and the body more than raiment. Now listen to this. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather in the barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take you thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast in the oven, and shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? What is he saying? Brothers, says, you got to believe. That's it. You and I have got to believe that God will provide. When I put God first, if I wake up and I have God on my mind, God will keep me on his mind. I've got to believe that he knows how to take care of me. I've got to believe that nothing will happen in my life that God is not already privy to. Thirdly, 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 when you're going to win over worry, you don't do something that accomplishes nothing. Look at verse number 27 again. Look what he said. Which of you taking thought can add one cubit unto his statue? In other words, which of you worry and how does that change anything? You just worry and worry and worry. There's, there's homes that are broken up because you worry yourself to death. Either one or both or the whole family just overly worry. I always mention worry is like a, a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it won't get you very far. You just sit there, just worry. And there are many people just, just worry. And what worry does, I'm telling you, bro, what it does is it steals your time. That's what worry does. It steals your time, the time you could be praying, the time you could be talking to God, the time you could be moving on with your life. But you're just so worried that you worry yourself to death when you should pray. Well, so there are going to be some things. I don't know who wrote that serenity prayer, but I, I, I like it. You know, it, it's just some things, you know, you got to ask God, God, help me, you know, to uh, to change the things that I can, to, uh, the things I can't change and help me to deal with it. and then. Give me the wisdom to know the difference. That's it. 
Because there are going to be some things that, brothers and sisters, that's going to happen in our life that you cannot do anything about. But that's not a time to leave God. That's not a time to stop praying. So we've got to trust God and don't be doing stuff that don't accomplish nothing. What, what, what have you worried about that, that changed anything? What have you worried about that changed anything? Overly worried, nothing. You, If you could change it, you change it. That's what you did. You prayed about it, you changed it. If you couldn't change it, you still prayed. That's it. That's what God wants you and I to do. Not do something crazy and lose your family and destroy your family. Fourthly, or fourthly, look at verse 33. Fourthly, you need to attend to the spiritual before the physical. I think that's where a lot of our problem is. We're seeking the wrong stuff first. In Matthew 6, 33, we quote this scripture. Some of us don't even have to look at it. We know what it says already. He's been in the church two days. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all, all these things shall be added unto you. Keep your mind on the kingdom. That's what he's saying. If you keep your mind on the king, the king will keep his mind on you. He's promised us the basics, food, clothes, and shelter. You know what our problem is? You know what our problem is? You know, what, you know why a lot of homes fail and end up in divorce? I'm talking about Christian home. You know why they fail? Because we don't just want food, clothes, and shelter. We want the best food, the best clothes, and the best shelter. And if that means forsaking study, prayer, worship, then I will forsake all of that so I can have the best clothes the best food, and the best house. And that's not seeking the kingdom first. Please understand that. We have to seek the kingdom first. What Jesus is teaching is, brothers and sisters, the money, yeah, nothing wrong with having riches, nothing wrong with bettering your family, nothing wrong with a nice house, a nice car, but you got to remember this. That stuff is not designed to bring you true peace. That's where people fail. People think that if I have the best house, the best car, the best food, that that's going to bring me the peace that Jesus promised to give. We've been studying, or we have studied, we've been studying Proverbs, but we've also studied Ecclesiastes. Go back with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Look with me, Ecclesiastes 5 with me. Be so kind. Solomon says it better than I can say it. Holy Spirit says it better than any of us can say it. In Ecclesiastes 5, look with me in verse number 10. Listen what he, look, look what I said here. He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also vanity. When goods increase, they are increased that eat them. And what good is there to the owners thereof, saving the beholding of them with their eyes? The sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eat little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. Drop down to verse 15. As he came forth of his mother's womb, naked shall he return to go as he came, and shall take nothing of his labor, which he may carry away in his hand. You see that? At the end of the day, money can't provide the peace that you and I, you and I need to have with God. That's simply what he's saying. And I'm, I'm afraid that what's happened uh, to a lot of Christian families' home, we've allowed riches to sabotage us. It, we've allowed it to sabotage our faith, to take us hostage. And so we do whatever we can. We'll sell Jesus. Oh, we'll point at Judas all day, won't we? Oh, he sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. I'm going to tell you something. There are some of us that are selling him out for far less, far less on this side of the cross than what Judas did because we love that money, 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 and stuff. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 4 with me. 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Real quick, listen to what Paul said to Timothy. 1 Timothy let me chapter, chapter 4, look with me in verse number 8. 1 Timothy 4, look with me in verse number 8 of your Bible. Paul says, for bodily exercise profited little, but godliness is profitable unto all things having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach. 
because we trust in the living God, who is the savior of all men, especially of those that believe. See, we got to see if we got Christ, we've got all that we need at the end of the day. We have what, what helps us to have that relationship that we need with the Father. Go to, go, go to 1 Timothy chapter 6 one more time, and I'm going to leave this alone. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Again, he's talking about godliness. That's what's most important, brothers and sisters, is godliness. God, godliness. Grace, God's grace teaches us to deny ungodliness. In, in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we carry nothing out. And having food, he didn't say the best food. He didn't, listen, don't see best food here. He didn't say, and raiment. He didn't say the best clothes. He said, just having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Again, nothing wrong with having nice food, eating steak. Nothing wrong with that. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money, not money, but the love of it is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they've erred from the faith and pierced themselves through, he says, with many, with many sorrows. And so all I'm saying, brothers and sisters, if we're going to win over worry, you got to attend to the spiritual before the physical. That's it. I need to take care of the spiritual things first, like Mary was doing and Martha wasn't back in Luke chapter 10. Mary knew what was, what was more important for her and for Jesus. And that is be listening to the word because that's what's going to last. And finally, finally, go back, go back, verse 34, Matthew 6. Listen to this, one more thing. Last of the five steps I'm going to give you tonight. Here's what I think Jesus is teaching us here. Look, look at verse 34 again. Take therefore no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. You know what anything he's teaching us there? If you're going to win over worry, you got to live one day at a time. That's it. One day at a time. You and I can only live one day at a time. You know, we think about these steps I mentioned. God's not asking you and I to do all these steps for 100 years. You know that? You notice that? Everything he's telling us to do, don't worry. You can't serve two masters. He's not telling you this is what I want you to do for 100 years. He's just asking you to do it today. If he wakes me up tomorrow, I'm going to wake up tomorrow. I'm going to announce my king. And I'm going to live right that day. If he wakes me up the next day, I'm going to just do these, these things that day. I'm going to announce him as my king. I'm not going to worry. I'm going to trust he's going to take care of me. If he wakes me up the next day, just one day at a time is the point he's making here. I mean, your brother says, when you and I stop trying to carry tomorrow's problems, <laughs> it's crazy. Many do trying to carry tomorrow. So worried about tomorrow. You might not even wake up tomorrow. You know that? You may not even wake up. Some of us worried about our children when they get 18. They might not make it to 18. How about that one? Worried about how I'm going to pay for their college fund. They might not live for college. Again, yeah, nothing wrong with planning. I'm just talking about how some people just worry. I got to get the money together. And you're missing church so you can you can get the insurance um, and, and, the, and, the, and the and the grants and the and the scholarships and, the, and everything else uh, for your children. And they might not even live to be 18. Now, what you going to do if they die? You planning for 18, they, they eight. You planning for 10 years down the road and you're leaving God out of the equation. Now, what you going to do if they die between 10 and 18? Now, what you going to do if you hadn't been putting the Lord first? Tell you what you're going to do. You're going to lose your mind. That's probably what you're going to do because you're living more for them and, and instead of God. James chapter four, go to James four. I know we know this. I'm going to stir up our mind, my mind and yours. This is to me. And just like it is to you. James chapter four and verse number 13. Listen what he says here. James chapter four and verse number 13. He says, go now, you that say today or tomorrow, we'll go into such a play, a city, continue there a year. We're going to buy, we're going to sell, we're going to get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the mark. For what is your life? It is even a vapor. Appeared for a little time and then it vanished away. For you ought to say, if the Lord will, 
we shall live and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and do it not, he says to him, it is a sin. So the question, who knows about tomorrow? Who knows about tomorrow? So all he's asking us to do, brother, sister, so you want to win over worry. Here's a, and I want to win over worry. All he's telling us, trust God today. That's it. Trust God today. Do the right thing today. And that's all God's ever asked of us. Let's pray. Our God and our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your word. Uh, Father, I pray for every kingdom family uh, represented on this Zoom. Uh, that Father, that we would all uh, check our foundation. Uh, Father God, uh, check our lives. And uh, Father, I just pray that we are all building on the solid rock. And that rock is Jesus. And I pray we trust him uh, with all our heart, all our mind. All our soul, trust your word. Uh, Father, know that it's true. And Father, we have nothing to fear. Uh, you didn't give us a spirit of fear. You gave us a spirit of love, uh, power, and of a sound mind. And I pray, Father, we will never let go of the great treasure uh, that we have in Christ Jesus, your son. And Father, if we're on here and we've been overly worried, over concerned about the future, God, we ask that you forgive us. And Father, we promise to do better today. And tomorrow, Father God, if it be your holy divine will, to allow us to see it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This time I'm going to open it up for any Bible questions, comments, anybody like to make it this time. Any Bible questions? Brother, uh, Henry, can you tell me the, the first verse that you used on Matthew 7 and the verses, please? Yes, 24 through 29. Uh, Matthew 7. 24 through 29, we look at the wise and the foolish builder, if that's what you're speaking of. Where we started this evening? Yes, yes. And I saying that it, this teaching tonight, you know, I mean, always, but it's like uh, a refresh, refreshing for the soul. It, it's a solace because it's a fax. Why are you saying, you know, I'm talking for myself, it's a fax, Thanks. but you know, it's it like uh, a light. Thank make your you. life light. That's why it's good to, to study. Yes, it is. Because... Yes, ma'am, my sister. You're right. And thank you for the encouragement. And again, that, that, that's just the power of God's word. And I appreciate the encouragement. Encourage me as well. Appreciate it, sister. Brother Javier. Yes, my brother. I just want to say a great lesson tonight. Uh, you know, it's uh, the mindset when it comes to the world. Is, this is how they move. This is how they think. You know, and they go to drugs or anything else to an outlet to escape uh, when they worry. Uh, and so it's a good thing to bring on the mind of the saints, myself and others on here as well. And those who listen. Um, I was thinking about uh, scripture in in the uh, book of Jonah, chapter four, uh, verse six, uh, where it says the Lord God prepared a gourd, made it to come up over Jonah. It might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day, smote the gourd, that it withered. And came to pass when the sun did arise, that God prepared a vehement east wind. The sun beat upon the head of Jonah, and he fainted. It says that he fainted and wished himself to die, and said it is better for me to die than to live. God said to Jonah, Dost thou, doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? He said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for the which thou hast not labored, neither made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not spare Nineveh, that great city wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between the right hand and the left, and also much cattle? So I just wanted to read that because. Um, when it comes to his worry, he was worried about not teaching unto them. So he tried to escape on a ship and to Tarshish. And so and then he was worried about uh, him being inside of a of a of a fish. God showed him mercy. He preached a word message. Now he's worried about them wanting them to be lost. And then he switch he switches over to the gore. So his mind is going back and forth on on worrying about things he shouldn't be worried about. 
he should have been worried about their soul, but he wasn't worried about their souls. And he wanted them to to die. He wanted uh, he was worried more about the gore than, than the people. And so it just it's an example of this is a minister, this is a preacher. By the way, this isn't just a you know any person uh, that's you know maybe in a church in a body um, that just believe. This is a, a believer in the Old Testament that also ministered and his heart swayed into different directions in this in this book and he was he was focused on things he shouldn't have been worried about and instead of the most important thing so the gourd is something that god gave him and then he took it away and so it's just an example everything that is on this earth as good comes from god we should have the mindset of a job where job said the lord give it the lord take it away because it's all temporal anyway and so always carry that mindset, you know, that it belongs to God in the first place, whether it's a person, a thing, or whatever it may be. So it just uh, stirred me up to read those verses, my brother. I'll toss it back. Great lesson to me. Thank you, preacher. Thank you for the exhortation, and thank you for those, those scriptures, my brother. Anyone else? Anyone else? All right. I'll go ahead, Brother Coffee. Uh, yes, I just wanted to real quick, uh, when you was in Daniel chapter number three, and especially in verse number 15, and some other comp and, you, and your other comment was Jesus would give you um, the instructions and, and also how to do it. And, when, and and the word that stuck out in, in, in chapter, excuse me, chapter three and verse 15 in Daniel was the word image. And so when Jesus, when, when the scripture gives us um, instructions on how God desires us to worship him, he didn't tell us to bow down to other images. Um, to worship him. That's the wrong image. He wants us to worship him with our hearts, with, you know, soul tree and lips and so forth with song. And or he doesn't want us to worship on Sunday on Zoom study. He told us to come together. You know, he didn't say worship him with, with these praise teams and all this other. That's the wrong image. And so when we study the scriptures, we have to follow the examples and we have to be taught what those examples are. If we're going to make heaven our home, let's just keep simple things simple. And when we fall into all these things that, that man desires to do. And, and as you went and saw these three brothers who, who, who contended for the faith, if, if you don't mind, um, that's what pleases God. And so that's how we build our strength and not be worried about the outcome. Well, well, okay, you kill me. What, 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 you can't kill my soul. You know, just give me, a, a hurry up to the place where we all desire to go. That's my comment. Amen. God bless you, brother. Anyone else? Anyone else? All right, saints, if you're on here and you're not a Christian, um, friends, we want you to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, be added to the people of God you can read about in the Bible. Hear that Jesus died for your sins. Believe it with all your heart, mind, and soul, and be willing to repent. Repentance is a change of mind, which leads to a change of action. You know, I say this, and I'll say it till I die. People won't go to hell for sin. You're going to go to hell because you won't repent of your sin. That's the idea. God wants us to come to the knowledge of truth so that we can repent. That's what he wants. And so you got to repent of how you've been living, how you've been worshiping, acknowledge that you are a sinner, and then confess that the father sent his son so that you don't have to die. He is the mediator. He is the perpetuation for your sin. So you got to confess that he is the son of God. The reason he came to this world, the reason he died, the reason he was buried, the reason he rose, it was for your sins and for the sins of the world. And you got to be willing to confess that. Not confess your sins. You confess that you believe he's the son of God. And then upon your confession of faith, you get baptized in water for the remission of your sins. In water, what happens is Jesus, who is alive, who sits at the right hand of his father, will give you the indwelling of the Holy Spirit once you get into the water. You don't become a Christian one second prior to the baptism. You just don't. You're not a Christian until you get into that water and Jesus gives you his spirit. Then you rise out of the water. Acts 2.47, you're added by the Lord to the church or the people of God that you can read about in the Bible. And again, we baptize on any day that ends with why. And it doesn't matter what time of the day. Not going to vote on you. Uh, just going to take your confession and then we'll uh, put you in water and Jesus will save you and add you to his people. Live faithful unto death 
and then and only then can heaven be your home, okay? And so whoever invited you on here, if you're not a Christian, get with them. Uh, they'll put you in contact with the right people to answer any questions. If they can't answer, they'll find somebody who will, and we'll give you book, chapter, and verse, okay? And you can have that done tonight. Uh, we baptize two, three in the morning. That's how important it is. If we can find the right people uh, to baptize you on tonight. If not, we'll keep struggling and striving until we do put the right people in your vicinity to where you can, in fact, get baptized. OK. All right. And if you're listening via YouTube uh, or Zoom, uh, you know, after the fact, uh, get, a, get a hold of myself. 281-965-4875. Uh, 281-965-4875, and I'll help you uh, to the best of my ability, okay? All right, anybody have any uh, Bible, any uh, prayer requests? Any prayer requests before we close out? Any prayer requests or even Bible question? Anybody got a Bible question? Okay, if not, uh, any prayer requests? Any prayer requests? Okay, if not, let's pray. Our God and our Father in heaven, we thank you again for an opportunity to study your word via this Zoom. Uh, thank you for every soul, Father, who... Father, not robbery, take time out of their schedules to make the sacrifice. Father, as we make efforts on Tuesday nights, Father, to help our families be stronger uh, than what they can be, Father, and, and what they are, Father, from time to time. Father God, we understand that we need the solid rock, Jesus, to be our foundation, and we're going to stand and withstand. Uh, in fact, really, the greatest enemy that we all going to face, the greatest storm and that is that is death until you send your son jesus back and so father i pray we all prepare ourselves our lives father for that day and father just live one day at a time uh, trusting that you are able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think again just again want to continue to pray for our brother bowers uh and the loss of his his, his loved one uh, thank you i pray you strengthen and he and his family and father all on this zoom who are dealing with loss of loved ones dear god we know that you're a god of all comfort uh, weeping may endure for a night, but we know joy will come in the morning, dear God. And just, just pray for that family, Father, as they go through this, this trying time. We understand we cry here, but there's a day that's coming when all tears will be wiped away from our eyes, and we long for that day. We love you, Father, and we thank you for what you sent your son Jesus to do, that we might live. And it's in his name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Good night, saints. Love y'all to love God. Next study will be uh, Thursday on Brother Green's Zoom page, 7 p.m. All right. Good night, saints. Love y'all. Stay safe. Good night. Good night. Good night.